is a concept where you take an image and you identify that image as being a dog or a cat or whatever type of image it is. Or you could just take two groups of image and classify one image as either a dog or a cat, any sort of stuff like that. So why is this important? First, self-driving cars, as you know, all the Tesla Model Xs are out there, they are self-driving. The important thing is, is that these cars need to differentiate between a pedestrian and a vehicle, and what image recognition allows us to do is do that sort of thing, and allow us to anticipate like stop signs, red light versus green light, stuff like that. Next is facial recognition, which is most apparent in Apple iPhone Xs, where you just sign in with your face ID and you're in. And this is just increased, and this is way better with image recognition because of all these spaces and the small differences between these spaces. Image recognition allows us to better differentiate between every single person's face. Next is touch ID, which is the same thing but with different things. Next is medicine, and medicine is a huge deal. Every single company is coming out with new medicine Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, and essentially these types mostly develop around three things. First is finding tumors, and early tumor detection is helpful in stopping cancer. Second is visual, visualizing blood flow, which can better help the medical scientists detect what kind of blood you have and what treatment you might need for any blood diseases. Second is stopping severe diabetes. There's a case of diabetes, which if you detect it, you be stuck prevent it. And that's a kind of hereditary diabetes where you get it passed on when your father or mother has diabetes. And if we detect it fast enough, then we can easily prevent it. And that's a sum of uses, which image recognition is beneficial. So let's talk about the history of image recognition. So first, computer scientists started to try image recognition out in the 80s and early 90s, and all these led to failure because what they would do is they would say, okay, what makes a car so special? It's shape. What makes a duck so special? It's shape. So they just hard coded in detectors for each of these shapes and just scan image for detectors. The problem with this is, is that for example, there's a shadow right here in the shape of a car or some portion of the image that has a car, but the majority of pictures are duck. The image is gonna result in the detection as a car, which is not what you want at all. Or also, if you look at the top S versus like this is the meta picture of S, if with image recognition, we can I easily say that this is also an S, but in the 80s and 90s, you weren't able to do that because you need precision. You need to know exactly what an S looks like because you're, after all, they did hard code detectors for like what it looks like. But in 1994, this guy named Jan Lacun, who was a genius, made the first convolutional neural network. And what that did was it took like a bunch of images and was able to classify those images with a 95% success rate, which was extremely huge at the time because no other neural network or anything had above a 50% success rate. I'll get into what a neural network and convolutional neural network is later on, but just know that it's a way that you can classify images. And in 2012, Alex Krzyzewski, which is another genius, and I think at this point a millionaire for this idea, you see him to make his own identifier. He called it AlexNet. And what it did is it took around 1.2 million images and took 100 groups. And he used uh, Lacoon's idea of a convolutional neural network and supplied it to a broader scale and enhanced it. And it was able to make it was able to classify all these images into all these groups with an 85% success rate, which was again unbelievable at the time. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is a subset for artificial intelligence, which I'm sure all of you know about. It's very common, but essentially what it is, is the computer looks through a bunch of data, and once it becomes more familiarized with the data, it becomes better and better at identifying the data and continuing doing certain functions with the data. And what this mainly uses pattern recognition, as you can see here. And in this graph, you see unsupervised learning and supervised learning. The key difference is unsupervised learning just gives you images, while supervised learning gives you images and what the value is. So say that you're gonna make a neural network that detects handwritten digits and converts them to actual digits, which is what I'm gonna show you in my code later on. So what you would do with supervised learning is you would give it the handwritten digits and the numerical value as like an int, and then you would provide both of those values to the neural network while unsupervised, you just give it to the drawing. And those are the vastly different fields of machine learning. Next, we'll dive into what is a convolutional neural network, the thing I've been talking to you about, and what this entire presentation is about. So what it is, is a multi-layered feature in identification images. That seems complicated, but I'll break it down for you. So what are human neural, what our human neural system does, and that's what Krzyzewski did back in 2012, and that's what 
other scientists did back then to make convolutional neural network, is that they use what we do with our eyes. And what we do essentially is we recognize patterns. So first we recognize lines, patterns, then it becomes more confident as you go through layers, as you can see here. The more simplistic layers just detect lines, then it goes to shapes, and eventually it goes to stuff like faces and really complex stuff like names, objects, etc. And that's what they did. They use a multi-layered system where the first layer just detects lines and then it goes complex as you move on. And what it does is it develops filters as it goes through an image. And once these filters are developed, you can test images. So say like you develop so say you develop a filter for cars and you say, okay, each car has like a front bumper. So then what would you, uh, this is very simplistic obviously, but you would use this filter then to scan other images for a filter. So if you see an image of a duck and you see that it doesn't have a front bumper, then you would say, okay, this isn't a car because it doesn't pass through the filter. That's essentially what convolutional neural networks is. And more images mean more complex filters and more filters in general. Okay, so there's two main implementations which I'll show you. There's two main companies. Both of these are made by Google software engineers, but there are other stuff like Microsoft, CATK, Deano, etc. There's just like a lot of stuff because more and more companies want to develop into machine learning versus TensorFlow, which is the main thing that Google has its focus for. It's written in Python and all, every single example I'll show you is written in Python. And Python is just a superior language. And it's very accessible because Google wants people to recognize these, want to recruit people into their data science, so they use it, so they make it extremely accessible, which is good for people who want to dive into this, because then you can have a better understanding of what it is and easily begin with it. And it allows for visualization of the neural network. Basically what TensorBoard is, and I'm not gonna use it, but it's just a good thing to know. It's like a graphic representation on how well the neural network's are doing. So at the start, it's probably gonna have an accuracy of 20%, and by the end, after like about 1,000 images, it's gonna jump up to 90%. And what I'm gonna use after this is gonna use around 1,000 images because that's where you get like your real amount of accuracy, your 95% accuracy, like what Alex did, uh, what Alex net achieved in the past year. So next is maybe the, the best neural network API ever, Keras API. It is huge and everyone loves it. Um, this is a Python API that's become more accessible over the years, and it's a very fast and growing one, and many people many people like it because it is the standard API for neural networks, and it's what almost everyone uses, and it's just the best one out there. Some people say- Is that an open standard? Yes, it's completely, both of these are completely open source, which is why I like them a lot, so it's really good. All right, so here are just some online demos. I already pulled some of them up. So, so first is Pythonic OCR. So if you would just enter any alphanumeric character like A, hand drawn, which is kind of what we'll be do what I already coded, and I'll show you guys. We submit it and it takes a while. Neural networks can uh, See, uh, the problem with this one is they didn't really put enough um, images in, but I think you should miss one. Yeah, okay. So you can identify any alphanumeric character in the alphabet or in the number system. More or less, it'll identify the number, which is really cool. Then this is the Google Vision API, which is also really cool, because um, I downloaded this picture of the happy person, and it should be able to identify what kind of emotion it is. Yeah, so it says joy, very likely sorrow, and it has like a bunch of labels too. As you can see, it has a blue shirt, blue head, a hand, finger, and stuff like that. And Microsoft has a similar thing, but yeah. So these are just some of the ways that these huge companies are making this. They implemented GUI and everything because it's just much better that way. Okay, so now I'll dive into my code here. I use Sublime Text and all of this is in Python. First I'll show you what I did in Keras API, then we'll move on to TensorFlow. TensorFlow is really hard to understand, but I think Keras API is a bit simpler. And if you guys have any questions, please like raise them immediately, because this concepts are extremely complicated and you, you yeah, okay. So, First, we usually do the setup batch size, just the number of samples that I'm going to be using. 
which is 128 in this one. Number of classes, this is the amount of classes you split them up in. In this case, I'm using this database called um, MNIST. It's an MNIST data set. And what it is, it's a bunch of hand-drawn numbers from zero to nine. And what it does is it associates them with the integer value from zero to nine. And what our world is neural network to do is it's gonna be able to identify each different image from itself, which is really cool. So none classes, there are 10 because it goes from zero to nine, identifying which ones. Epoch is just training cycles. Usually people like to set these high in really high numbers like 10 or 20, but for the sake of this now, because it wants to go quicker, I just set it to one. Uh, image rows, image columns, these are just pixel measurements of each image. Uh, this is just getting the data from the set, and all this is mostly set up. So let's move on to where I actually define the model. So first I define the model as sequential. What sequential is, is just a linear stack of layers. I said before, what the human eye does is it detects from, sh from simple lines to shapes and progressing more. And this is what the sequential does do. It's just a linear stack of layers and just adds on top of each other. So the first layer I add is the convolutional layer. It's called COM2D in this. And what it does is it assesses a bunch of pictures. So let's take this picture of a mouse, for example. What it sees is it sees, a, let's say that the filter that it wants to detect is the back of this mouse, like here. So what it does is, is it breaks it up into a matrix like this, and where zero values are gonna be white and 30 is gonna be black. We'll just have this for this instance. Most of the times it's in a color, so it gets a bit more complicated. But I like this because it's very simple. So in order to assess what, so the filter development is pretty self-explanatory. It just looks for the filter is similar in each image. And now where it assesses an image, so how it assesses an image of whether or not it's a zero to nine, it does it by basically taking this filter, let's say the yellow thing right here is the filter, and the green thing right here is the image. What happens is it takes this filter and it slides it across the image as this um, GIF is showing. And what it does is it brings a, what's called a convolve feature, which is just a shrunk down vector, and it'll just tell you whether the feature is present or is not present later on. And this is a much better uh, visualization. So what it does is it's scanning at the back of the mouse, which is what we're detecting for. And what it sees here is if you use the filter on a part of the mouse which we're detecting for, the result is 6,600, which is a really large number. That basically just indicates that the feature is present in the picture. On the other hand, if you're going to look here at the top right where its face is, and remember if you're scanning for the back, it's gonna show zero or a very low number because this is not what the feature that we're looking for. And usually they just use this just to test it because they wanna see whether or not the feature is appearing in the image or not. Does anyone have any questions because this is some complicated stuff. No, all right. So, and this is what is done when there is a colored image. There's three different rows, each RGB. I think all of you are familiar with how pixels are done in RGB values. And what it does is instead of doing what I just showed you in black and white, it just does it three times with each image. And just make sure you know that there's not just going to be one end-all, be-all filter with all these convolutional neural networks. <coughs> there's going to be a lot more filters, and the more complex you want to find out, the more filters there are going to be. So, as I'll explain later, this makes a big difference when computing power, and that's how we're going to be using some of these other ones. Yeah. Where is the filter stored? Is oh, the filter is just, all of this is stored locally, but you could upload this to a database. It's just all stored somewhere. And remember, the purpose of the filter is just for detection and it'll develop the filter over time as it scans through the images. So there's kind of two, I should explain this more, but there's two phases of what CARES API does. It's first is training, then is testing. What training does is it detects for these filters and says, okay, these are the filters that are appearing. And then it's testing where it says, okay, we have all these filters. Now it's time to test them on these images to see whether or not these are actually appearing in the image. So now, so, so who has to create filters? What? Who has to create filters? Is it, is it humans are creating No, no, no. It's or? all done by the computer. The computer itself detects on features that are similar between all these pictures. So let's say that you want to do a bunch of mice. The computer itself detects, okay, so all of these mice have back ends and I mean yeah. And and that's when they that's when they form that filter of 30 values and zero values. I'll just go back so you get a bigger picture. Yeah, so the computer automatically detects for these as it looks through the image, and then it applies them after it tests. Any other questions? 
Uh, so what what do those values represent in red? You know, the four, three, four. So four, each three, time four. a filter is passing over a region yeah, of so the image, each, does that account of how many ones it's hit? Or Oh no, it just multiplies the values and so one times one and then it sums them all up. It, it's if you all are familiar with vectors and dot products, what it essentially doing is it's taking a dot product of those vectors, where it's multiplying each number by the corresponding thing and adding them all up. And this is just an extremely easy way of detecting whether or not a, if the feature is present in the image. All right. So next is the ReLU function. What the ReLU function does is it makes sure that it's not linear. They want a non-linearity thing. And what this essentially does is it just replaces all negative values with zero. And it's not going to be as simple as I said before. It's not just going to be 30 and zero. Sometimes there are negative numbers thrown in the filter. But what the ReLU function does is it's kind of attached to the convolution neural layer. And after it goes through the image and the size of values, it will just erase all the negative and replace it with zero. And what this means that the function is not going to be linear anymore. This is like a really complicated uh, idea to grasp, but essentially what this is doing is it's making sure that it's it's making sure that the function doesn't, it's making sure that when Curious API compiles it, it's not going to be, it's not going to just be reviewing it and saying, okay, it's positive, it's negative. What it's going to be doing is it's going to replace all negatives with zero in order for the compiler to better understand it. and. It's just overall better with you. I mean, ReLU isn't, even if you don't get this, ReLU isn't that important in Keras API. This is just a small thing that's added to the convolutional layer. As long as you understand the convolutional layer, this is just kind of an add on. So the next layer is the pooling layer. And I just had two convolutional layers here because, like, if you have two, it's more accurate than one. And I'll show you the image of that later. So next is max pooling. So what max pooling is used for is after you take a convolutional layer, it's going to be separated into three images. I mean, depending on the amount of filters. So let's take, let's say you have three filters and you take one image and test it for these three filters. That's going to result in three different um, matrices with all these values in them after you slide the filter across, slide the three different filters across the same image. So what max pooling does is it reduces the trouble that the computer needs to compile because after all, these are a lot of images that you need to do. So this is called max pooling. And what it does is it looks for like a two by two, a two by two vector and it says, okay, which one's the max value? In this case, it's six and then it moves that along. And this is to reduce the computational power that it needs. It's, and overall, the feature map or the image itself, after being um, sl slided, after the um, filter slides across the image, it's just going to be the same thing except the bigger values are accentuated more. It's not going to change anything. All it does is reduce the computational power. So next is the dropout layer. As you can see here, dropout, flatten, and dense. Flatten and dense are just add-ons to make sure that the uh, dropout layer works properly, but all you need to know is that they're part of the dropout layer. So what the dropout layer does is it prevents what, what's called overfitting. What overfitting is, is that after a neural network goes through a couple of tries with all these filters, it decides, okay, I've been using these filters for a long time, so I'll stick with them. But we don't want that to happen. What we want to happen is that it continuously improves over time. So what the dropout layer does is it just get rids randomly of some filters so that we see constant improvement. And so we see that the computer tries to go for new filters over time so that it can't just use the same one or two or three filters that it's been using. We want it to make the max amount of filters possible, to make the max amount of accuracy possible. So the dropout layer just gets rid of random, random filters. It's gonna come back later, but just temporarily. So is this, is this automatic or is this controlled by some set of parameters that lets you decide what, what characteristics will, uh, will allow a node to get dropped versus not? I mean, this is going to be completely random. We're not going to have the user choose which one because we want it to be extremely accurate. And I think the user wants to do it because, of course, the user wants to like, I mean, the coder wants to say, okay, we want to make this as accurate as possible, so just get rid of random ones as we go through in order to make sure that there's the max amount of filters possible. So this is just going to be automatic. No parameters are necessary. Okay, next is probability conversion. Um, as you can see uh, here, this is what, um, where it says softmax, 
This is what is the probability conversion. And essentially what's happening here is it's applying a soft mass soft max function. You don't really have to understand what these are. The main point is, is that you have a bunch of values after you apply the filter to the image. And what soft max function does is it takes these scores, what it, they call scores, but we just call them value. Actually, leave them as scores. After the filter goes on the images, gives them a score, and that changes those scores into probability. So you can say, okay, this image is 75% <coughs> of one, 20% of two, and 5% all the other stuff. So this just turns all of our data into probability. And this is so that the coder can understand, okay, this is 70% so that we'll better understand the network. Okay, so this is an overall picture of it. So you can see the first convolutional layer. And there are three different images here because remember, we're not just gonna use one filter. In this case, we're using three filters so that three different images are created after we apply the filter. Then the pooling, which it just makes it smaller to reduce computational power. Then it's the second convolutional layer, as I said, making two or more just increases the accuracy of our model. And it'll multi and remember there's three, so it'll add on three, so maybe six. Then the fully connected layers do they do what I say, they do what um, the soft max function does, this brings in all these together and changes them into probability values. So as you can see, in the end it just shows 94% of both and minimal all that the other stuff. So now we'll actually run this. So it's gonna take a bit of time to load because this is like a bunch of images has some formatting go through. So as you can see, it's like 60,000 training samples and um, 10,000 test samples. And what that means is that it separated the, the images on training and test samples. Training is just recognizing the filters and making new filters. Testing is after the network is completely done. I'm going to use it to test the accuracy of my uh, neural network. So, so is this it, is just it going to. Is it running in your machine or in the cloud? In my machine. I, don't, I didn't do the cloud because <coughs> this isn't too much data in my machine to do it. So, ETA just means the time it takes to finish. Loss is. There's this whole thing in neural networks that is minimizing loss. Loss is essentially what happens when, when you go through a layer and there's not a new filter happening, and you want that to minimize because you want as many filters as possible. So that's just loss. Accuracy, obviously, is just the test accuracy of the data, which it goes through after it compiles with the test data. So uh, while we wait for this to finish, does anyone have any questions about anything I talked about? Question. You want to take the meeting also because I changed the experiment. Oh, I, I did I did this at the start, but I'm green and my experience with coding, I'm a sophomore in South. My experience with coding, I've been to two hack competitions, Keene University and at St. Peter's Prep. Hack competitions. Yeah, hack it on this. Yeah, they're just I mean it's not like actual hacking, it's just making your own apps and stuff. So the first competition I won second place for an app that detected gum disease. Second, and the second one, I won Maker's Choice, which is where a bunch of coders voted off whose project was best. And that one, I did, uh, we made a open source news thing where users could make their own news articles, and that just eliminates the political biases that are there. So, any questions relevant to? Uh, so, with the uh, with the training data and the test data, did did you specify? what you're looking for, or is it just an auto-classification? Oh, I specify. Uh, what I did was I specified how many images were going into training and testing, mm -hmm. but I didn't look, I didn't say what I was looking for, because I want the neural network to do it by itself, and I don't really need to do that. That's what they actually did. In the startup presentation, I mentioned how that's what they did in the 80s and 90s. They tried to look for certain parts of the data where they wanted, but that didn't work out at all. They'd rather have the computer make its own classifications. And it's a similar to what our eyes can do, where it looks from complicated. Uh, as I said before, uh, at the start of the presentation, what our eyes do is it starts out with lines and then it goes to more complex things like shapes and faces, and that's what it does. So yeah. this, on the on the slide where you had the ninety four percent probability that it's a boat versus a dog, a cat, and a bird, where do you specify a dog, cat, and bird? Oh, that's in, when we, in, in that example. That's when we identify, uh, if I scroll up on my code, 
Um, that's where we identify num classes, classes are the different classifications of the image, mm -hmm. and you can just identify. This one I don't specify because it's already loaded in the data set. This is the MNIST data set that just already has all these classifications, so doing the heavy lifting for me. But I did my own custom thing in TensorFlow. I'll show that later, like momentarily. So as you can see here, value accuracy and test accuracy are basically the same thing. 98% which is really good, um, especially for one that's not. Although 60,000 may seem like a lot of images for testing, in reality it's not that many images, especially when compared to other things. Like AlexNet, as I said before, did 1.2 million images, which is huge. It must have taken a while to compile. So, yeah. So, this, uh, you're printing this thing yourself as part of your code, or yeah. is it part of the... I'm printing it as well. <coughs> yeah, so one thing is that accuracy, I think you want the formatting to be like a 91% because the loss is that, right? So if you move it 26% oh, okay, and 91, loss. right? Loss is, loss isn't, test accuracy plus not, loss is not going to be 100%. No, no, loss no, is, what I'm saying is that accuracy is 91%, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. What you're yeah, yeah, but it's zero point nine makes it kind of. Uh, I thought it's uh, uh, not able to uh, identify. That's what I thought. No, no, but it's good. It, it looks like it's good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, just a formatting thing, right? Yeah, the format was already provided by Keras API, uh, yeah. so this isn't my format. This is yeah. what they did. Okay. And I just use this because it's like easier. Simple. And what when you say testing, right? What how exactly? I know this is not manually done or supervised, right? Mm -hmm. How are you testing it? Are you is it kind of automated saying you're speeding? So up? this is actually a form of supervised learning. So like each each um, number is relevant to each hand drawn image of a number is relevant to an actual number. So they said, okay, we'll have an image of zero and we'll give it a value of zero. And these coders hand coded it in for us. It took like sixty thousand months. Mm -hmm. They probably sat through a lot of hours, but they did it. And that's what I did when I did testing. I went through all these and compared what the uh, what my what the neural network said it was to what the coders actually programmed it to be. And that's what testing. Is so for all these ML related things, all the testing, uh, get into hard code to verify the test. I mean, yeah, that's all what the machine learning use cases. I mean, yeah, that's what they did when they first made the data set. They hard coded all this in. But every single step that I used. There's no hard code in that. That's just what they initially did. That's what's called supervised learning. And then that's why there's a difference between unsupervised learning and supervised learning. So how do we input the accuracy? You know, like for example, let's uh, say, more, yeah. you could add more layers, more images. So as part of training, so we need to provide more training to them. Yeah, you could provide more training data in order for like more accuracy. Everything revolves around filters. You're trying to have the most filters as possible and the most accurate filters as possible in order to increase the accuracy of your network. And that's essentially what we're doing right now. You could either increase the amount of layers, which increases the amount of filters, or you could add more layers. How do you increase the number of layers? What oh, you just add more layers. So like what I did here, I just, okay, so Keras API, you need to do model by add. That's just a command in Python. And whenever you do that, you're just adding another layer. So you can just add one more convolutional layer. I didn't do this because like, it would take a lot more compiling power from my computer, but you just do it just how I said. Uh, 32, 33, that's just picture measurements right now. And curse up. In this particular example, you're looking at numbers, I understand. But if you take the, the, the self-driving cars example, which is a real-life scenario, where when the car goes and can see anything, so how do you how does that apply filters? Is there a vast pool of filters it picks up? Yeah, so as I said before, right one? like what images use they in black and white images this use like thirty or zero or one and zero. They're binary. So what color images do, and that's what like stop signs have. There's a bunch of color images. There's just a three D version of that where the depth is equal to red, gray, and blue. Uh, red, green, and blue. I said this in the previous. It's, there's a good image. Ah, oh, here. So this is essentially what it breaks down to. It's the same thing, just that there's more, just that the matrix has like depth to it, which is relevant to red, green, and blue. And it and what they and what um, Keras API automatically does for um, colored images is that it grayscales it as well, so it can see the images on the shape as well as seeing connections between the color. So it can say like stop sign is red, but also it's an octagon. They can create filters for both of those. Yeah. Okay. I thought you had a demo on uh, yeah, cats and dogs, right? Something yeah. Like this is my tensorflow demo. 
what I did was this one, it's a lot, it's very complicated. I don't want to bother explaining it. I already built a network because that took a long time to build. So this is just testing it on a bunch of images. So what this one does is I just put two groups of images in two different folders. Cats and dogs, I put like 300 images in each folder. And there were just images of cats and dogs. And what it does is I provided images of cats and dogs and identified it. So we'll run that one. This is written in TensorFlow, which is different from Tails. It's worse, but uh, it's tough. It came up on it in different frames. Just press on your entire desktop. All right. So I'm not sure. The font's pretty bad. This manual is really good TensorFlow. But if you can see, it says cat with 99.97% confidence. And I loaded a bunch of images here. Okay, this one says cat with 99.84. This one's 99.90. And then I put a bunch, I put three dog images as well just to see the actual that. This one's dog 94, 94.51%. And yeah, that's what TensorFlow, that's what the TensorFlow code does. It classifies dogs, cats. And if you want, I could like upload a picture from online. So does anyone have a free to free to drop dog or cat? <laughs> Can, can I recognize the number of objects? For example, there are two cats sitting there, right? You could do can I that. recognize there are two cats? I didn't, that's not what I did with this TensorFlow object, but you could program it to recognize two, four, six, eight. Again, just a matter of filters. But I didn't program it that way. So, what's your favorite dog? Pog. Pog. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Is that even a dog? <laughs> Eugene. Try Eugene. German Eugene. Shepherd, it's yeah. easiest to find, or a boxer. No, oh, Eugene. No, it's the right one. Okay. So I'll take this again. I'll just see which one for me that I have. So I created two folders, one is training, one is test. I only put like three images in the test folder. I, it doesn't show anything now for some reason, but yeah. Let me go back to my computer to see if it's that way, and then I'll pull it up. No, no, I just screw it. Yeah, it just grows so fast. Right? Now he's teaching me. Huh? Now he's teaching you. <laughs> I'm not a math guy. Before that, the amount of images which is training in the number should be going up a few, few more even if you have a good GPU and make the cluster oh, right. the training go much faster. Extension. Right, I was just going to ask you what, what yeah. formats can you process? Yeah, it was only J I can only process JPEG. I tried. Let's still work with that too. So what yeah. happens if you're just calling any of the packages? Can you try one? I mean, it's I mean, it's bound to fall on one of them, but it's going to be like really inaccurate. So if you show a picture of like a car, depending on what it looks more like a cat or dog, it's going to say what it's calling. It's it's much easier. To so as you can see here, it's dog with 87.4. If you want, I could do a picture of the car. Thank you, 
is key. But actually, you know, Microsoft and a lot of these companies have other stuff, right? Where you don't really have to code all these things. Right. You know, there is a UI, there's something called Vision.ai, right? You just go upload the images, but it's not, it cannot detect subtle differences. Like what he's doing is with Keras API and TensorFlow, that's the, you know, model behind yeah, it, right? Yeah. So the big problem with Microsoft API is that what it does is it... <laughs> 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 you know, he, he just, he uses applied. Google, right? You know, that's how he you uses it. He's not going to be applying for a job. Using unless you do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The problem with using like a default like Microsoft, or even Google's one, is that it just stores like a bunch of images to what it is. But if you, if you want to look more specific, like if you want to go into the medical field and say this is a tumor and this isn't a tumor, you're going to have to make your own neural network and process your own images and maybe add or delete a few layers just to make it as accurate as possible. So. By the way, I'm using Opera. My browser is Opera, if you notice in the video. It's the best browser by far. <laughs> Okay, so we'll see what happens when we do car. Okay. So apparently a car looks most like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's what I have to be checked. But what happens when we try the right? It's saying that the price will be the dog. I mean, the reason it has <laughs> filters and like, it's just all numerical data, and that's kind of the reason. It just processes the filters, it takes values, and as I said before, that um, softmax function converts those values into probability values. Dogs and spiders are classified as I think stored somewhere in, in objects or class in your PSP. Oh, it's stored in this. It's stored in this class. As the neural network goes through, the patterns are recognized on the go, which is the cool part about neural networks. They recognize and compile stuff on the go, which is much better because you don't want it. Again, that was a problem in the 80s and 90s where they tried to hard code different types of filters. And really, you should let the neural network decide its own filters because that way it'll be more adept at recognizing them. Is it comparing against a centralized database or not? I mean, yeah. I think you could do that, but I just, for, for my, for my uh, Keras API thing, TensorFlow is vastly different because, like, you need to use a lot more math than this in TensorFlow. Well, in, in Keras API, Keras API is like a bunch of building blocks. You call it, I, told, I talked about it too, as layers, but essentially just stacking layers on top of layers. TensorFlow you actually have to be defined layers and do a bunch of math to like, get there. Yeah, I think the question is like, you know, how did you train it, right? So like you had a bunch of, you know, you took the MNIST database, right? Which had all this, you know, millions of cats and dogs. Well, no, MNIST is- Oh no, this is a different zero 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 zero. Okay. So, I, I did my own cats and dogs thing. But what MNIST is, is just, as I said before, it's supervised learning. Where it gives you a drawing and then you run the corresponds. But you trained it with a bunch of cats and dogs and you created your own layers. No, cats and dogs is in TensorFlow. No, but you, you did train it, right? That you created the model. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, cats and dogs and 0, 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9. The one I did uh, with Keras API is completely separate from cats and dogs. So it's, it's important to recognize that and I just compared it. Right. <laughs> All right. I go. Is that a cat or a dog? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jivan, I think I guess it depends on the use case, right? Yeah. What you want? Here you have tracked the most of the supervised learning, right? Yes. So, in case of unsupervised learning, how do you test it? Yeah, that's what TensorFlow does. It uses unsupervised learning. What the problem is, you need to, in order to get like a test percentage, you need to actually have hard coded data that compares the image to the value. Well, this is like no way of testing it, especially when you're like, think about it like this. If you're the AI model and you're given your own networks, whenever you analyze an image, you'll say, okay, this is a cat, you're 97% sure, but you have nothing to compare the accuracy to, then you have no idea whether you're right or wrong because you're the neural network. But that's what my Keras API thing did, is it compared it to what the MS data set had in the 0, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's the digits. And it compared it to the hard coded values there, so it was able to test the accuracy. For the cats and dogs thing, 
As you can see, the only confidence it showed you is the confidence of whether it was a cat or a dog. It wasn't able to show the right percent accuracy. That's a problem with unsupervised learning. We don't get accuracy. But the advantage is that you don't have to hard code 60,000 different numbers. Main advantage of unsupervised learning is basically you can't do actual things, right? Exactly, so and you don't have time. At, at the end of the day, the, <coughs> the result is much, much better than supervised learning. I mean, that's I mean, kind that's of... That's what people uh, say. I mean, that's the main advantage. Now, the point is, what I'm asking is, in the supervised learning, you are having a set of data and you are doing any skip. So, there you are limited. So, how do you enhance that data set? Are you taking from unsupervised learning data, put it back into supervised learning and then enhancing it? Unsupervised learning and supervised learning are just two different types of concepts. Very different. Yeah. And so what's mm -hmm. and the only the only difference is one gives you test accuracy and the other one doesn't. I mean in the end they both just use layers, stack layers. Like it's essentially the same thing, just riddled with that five billion dollars. So the ways that you improve supervised learning is the exact same ways that you improve unsupervised unsupervised learning. More layers or more users. So what happens if unsupervised learning if the object is unknown, right? So you try to scan that one and computer is not able to recognize it. What is gonna happen? Now I mean then it's basically a supervised. I mean the computer has to recognize basically what basically are you talking about the training data or the testing data? I'm just saying in general. Any object, for example, you just scan dog, right? And you recognize 98% of the time it's a dog. Yeah. Now, if suppose there's an XYZ object, which we know, but the computer doesn't know, what is going to happen? I mean, it's just going to do its best with the filters that it has to identify which is more confident. As I showed you with the dog, so, so, I just, so what is going to happen? Suppose, let's say, it recognizes 50% of the time. Right. Well, I just picked up an example, what you're asking mm -hmm. now, that's what I did. Yes. I picked a car just to show that it cannot recognize, it thought it's a dog. That it says 84% dog, right? That's what I asked you. Remember, no that but it learns over time, right? Yes, like yeah. over time, you yeah. know. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so what is going to happen? What sequence is going to happen so that it will learn over time? That's what I yeah, so that's, you know, it, conceptually the, it's the same thing, like the layers and all those things, but I think it takes those images and then refeed it to the system, right? So um, that's... The problem with neural networks and the computers is that the computer doesn't know that it's in the image. Like we know, like, this is obviously a car, not a dog or cat, but the computer can't make that distinction. All it knows is separate the dog or cat. So if you want, you could add another image or another... Um, you could add another folder which has cars and a bunch of pictures of that, and then it could recognize whether it's a dog, cat, or car. But to a computer, you say, okay, which one looks, does this call look more like a dog or cat? That sensor is actually. Basically, the use case is uh, either it's a cat or a dog, right? So that's the you know, purpose of the use case. So based upon that, you can identify that one. So for example, so basically, what you're saying is that you have to basically improve the search. Exactly. Like the car. That's what right. Google and like uh, that's what Google, Microsoft, and all the guys who are out there doing their own APIs. They just did a bunch of classifications. They don't know the computer itself won't know these different classifications unless you yourself program it to have these classifications. Right. Or there's this concept of like having a neural network inside a neural network and developing that. But that's like they're still experimenting with that. So. They haven't really fully recognized the capability. Uh, have you ever developed any, like, just back on this point, the quality experience where in a transaction, both can enter and apply the same thing and make decisions on I mean, the transaction? I mean, that has to do with, like, it's com transition. complex data. All I do is I take the API sure. and I say, like, okay, using this okay. API, I can develop <coughs> So when you say cognitive, so like what do you mean? Like you learn? Okay. Machine learning. Yeah, that's what that's yeah, yeah. yeah, that is a like this is deep convolutional neural network, which is specifically for image classification. But you know, convolutional neural networks is not really the best for that kind of a scenario, right? You know, there's other sort of like regression analysis and other. Yeah. Well, but even if you were to apply this, you should be able to add wrap around an orchestration layer around it, and then say that if something hits a certain probability or above, uh, and or your accuracy, depending on supervised or unsupervised, do something. Yeah. Up else, do something else, right? Exactly, that's so, just adding on to the, right. the functionality that you have now. So the iPhone uses which one? 
Just to yeah. supervise or unsupervised for the face recognition? Just to this. I mean, it has his own. I mean, it has his own. No, you feed it, right? First, you, because you, have you take a picture, yeah. and you fade it, you take, you know, all the sides. Because of the think about it like this if you know that your face, that your face is, if they know that my face is the face of Varun, then that's supervised. But they don't know that. They're going to say, okay, after learning about this, they're going to say, okay, now I know this is Varun. That's unsupervised. So just know that if initially, before you find network, that you know which uh, images correspond to which data, then you, then that's supervised. If you know nothing and you just read images, unsupervised. How do you create synthetic data? Sorry? Synthetic data. Could you write it? So creating test data. Oh, How do you create test data? You just upload that. That's just different images. So like. Like what I do with the MS data set is just a bunch of data. And I just separated them like after, like they just numbered from one to like 80,000. 80, I just separated them to like from one to 60,000. That's all my training data. 60,000 to 70,000. That's all my testing data. So I just like, put, yeah. And with TensorFlow, I just put a bunch of images of dogs when I'm training and put like some in testing. And the important part is that your test data shouldn't be in your training data, or else that you don't really know if you're really actually doing fine because it's going to say 100%. Because it's already seen this. That's like the developer's testing. Exactly. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. yeah, one practical example, this is now they are trying out. I don't know anybody who is a network expert can explain this thing. That is, uh, network routers now they have started using machine learning. So, and they are using both categories one is supervised and other is unsupervised. They are saying unsupervised is giving a much better result. Of it. Like basically, unsupervised is how a kid learns. When he comes, to, uh, I mean, <clears throat> when a kid starts learning, he or she has no knowledge, nothing, no base. So they start learning, seeing, and all. So that part they are putting in the router. The only problem they are talking about now is basically if this network already is infected. It takes that as its right data and it inbuilds. That means you are producing something which is already wrong. That I don't know anybody who is so like adding them. all the routes and everything that's learning the routes from the it, different kind of you don't of have to do all the normally what you do we create the route you do it with the BGP you don't really like you put only one default route and then mm -hmm. rest it keeps learning from the protocols right that is from the protocol you are talking about here I am talking about the routing part of it okay the intelligent routing now what they are doing on this uh, on the router itself they started doing it one is the when you supervise learning then you put the first routing table Okay. And then it picks up from there. It builds on top of that. Whereas in unsupervised, you just bring the equipment, put it in Plug the it network. In and Actually, it and starts it learn. learning. It goes by transaction. It figures out what's learning. I think BGP is just waiting on how you transact. That's Transact more transaction. transaction. Here, what you're saying that is instead of having a route table, table. that creates a route. But here, you're not creating a static routing table, yeah. but oh, it, it, it automatically yeah. builds it. That's a okay. cool concept, actually. Okay, can you just re repeat all that in English for the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> so I think network, uh, you know, anytime network routes, right, that's a tip. No. Well, but then, From know, where I, to where it is. I was reading that, uh, you know, the pure unsupervised is good for things like anomaly detection, right? Rather than rules based, this gives you much more flexibility. And uh, there are lots of uh, applications in the military where you know different forms of, um, you know, field guns, arm, different forms of armory, and this, that, and the other. So when you don't recognize something, so that's why they're able to basically take these high resolution satellite images and uh, around combat zones, and they can actually accurately say how much armory is moving in uh, from the enemy. And if something's not recognized, that gets kicked out, somebody needs to look at it. So that's, a, that's an example of now a human needs to look at something. That's then used to create a training set. You know, they go out through their research and come back and that gets added in. The next time around when it scans, it knows about it. Yeah. So, then if someone wants to start learning, where does, it, where does one start? Uh, machine learning. Machine learning. Any other kid who wants to learn this, go back to high school. <laughs> that is, that oh, I'm baby, right? All the moms are asking what kids learn. Separate them. 
as all machine learning specialists would say, start with Cares API. You get to avoid all the complicated math and signals and all that mumbo jumbo. Where, and you just get to like say, adding on different types of layers. And you, there's a plenty of videos on YouTube and open source things. That's what I like about Cares API and TensorFlow. The Google engineers who made that made this almost completely open source. So like anyone can take some of this code. This code, I'm pretty sure this is code like this is probably just online floating around, so you can easily find this, plug it in and say, okay, I need analog instead of Python. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be like the first thing, first step to learn Python and then? Yeah, yeah of course. Just, yeah, it, okay. <laughs> but doesn't TensorFlow have a Java API? No, TensorFlow's, in, I'm pretty sure TensorFlow's written in Python API. Yeah. And Keras API is still in Python. And, um, Majority of better APIs are going to be in Python because that's where the majority of people are transitioning when they're using APIs. Most of them are to Python because it's a superior language. Yeah. Any any more questions? Or? Any more questions or? Okay. <laughs>